plant cells typically. African yeah, so, Af so on that ethnicity, if now there's a lot of kind of wiggle room here, but on one end we'd have Caucasians, blacks would be right nearby. African ethnicities would be quite close um, to the to the kind of Northern European ethnicity. And then we would move through, and, and I don't mean to miss anyone here, but on the other end it would be East Asian. And then sprinkled through that would be um, uh, Latino. Latino would be somewhere in the middle, kind of Hispanic. And then other Southeast Asian and then East Asian, kind of on the worst end or the least sensitive or the most <laughs> sensitive to their fat the most sensitive to their fat. This actually is a concept that has been presented called the personal fat threshold, which is this really interesting idea born from a group in Australia, suggesting that across every individual body, which of course is heavily influenced by both ethnicity and sex, like we'd mentioned earlier, a body is going to have a rate at which it can store fat in a healthy way. And then once that threshold is met, any further pressure to store fat will start creating insulin resistance. And that threshold is essentially how big, how many fat cells do you have and how much room do they have? So if you have more fat cells, you have a higher fat threshold. You can get fatter before it starts to hurt you. Does your fat distribution also matter here? Because oh, it does. different yeah. races, this research is telling me, have different fat distribution. It's saying that Africans have better fat distribution, mm -hmm. lower visceral fat. Yep and less metabolic risk because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caucasians, moderate fat cell quantity, more prone to subcutaneous fat accumulation. Which Subcutaneous. Is, which mm -hmm. is, that's the fat around the organs, Yeah, right? so Caucasians, and so, so let's say Northern European, African, both store more of their fat subcutaneously, which is the fat just beneath the skin, or the fat that you can pinch and jiggle. That has an ability to expand more because there's nothing really to limit it. Um, however, the other place for people to store fat is their visceral adipose, which is the fat that is tucked within the abdominal cavity, so tucked around the organs. It's sort of surrounding the kidneys and the intestines and the liver. That is an unhealthy place to gain fat, but an East Asian, all things equal, is putting much more fat there than they are subcutaneously. The advantage of subcutaneous fat is which that it, is the fat on the outside. Yeah, yeah. So the the like fat beneath fat. the skin. Yeah, the yeah the loose belly fat, the fat that can pinch and jiggle. That fat has a greater ability to make new fat cells. So as much as earlier you and I said fat cells remain static, for the most part they do. There's a little bit of wiggle room where it can go up, and that's purely subcutaneous. And Hispanics have higher fat cell quantity, more visceral fat. Yes and increased risk of obesity-related conditions. Yes, and so the problem with visceral fat is this is such a finite space. There's so little room within the core of your body that if we allowed those fats to multiply, it could theoretically start physically compressing on tissues. Right. And so those fat cells only grow through hypertrophy, which is the thing we talked about earlier with slow insulin resistance. Subcutaneous fat cells are more abundant but smaller Visceral fat cells are fewer, but much larger. And so any ethnicity, including Hispanic or Asian, that promotes relatively more fat storage in the visceral space is going to suffer from the consequences of that fat much sooner. And again, it still comes back to size. The bigger the fat cell, the sicker the fat cell. According to Alzheimer's Disease International, the total number of people living with dementia globally is expected to reach 139 million by 2050, which is up from around 55 million in 2020, which I imagine is in part related to people living a bit longer yeah, than they once yeah, did as could well. Be. Although, although over the past few years, life expectancy actually turned down for the first time in the history of modern world. So who knows if it will continue to go up, but yeah, it could be people are living longer. I mean, one of the effects of modern medicine is that people live longer with disease. Um, Alzheimer's included, but it's absolutely a consequence further of our overall metabolic milieu that we put ourselves in a position where we are making our brains insulin resistant and thus they're going hungrier and hungrier. There's a study you talk about, um, which you've cited before, that shows that if you move visceral fat from an obese animal to a lean animal, this immediately caused insulin resistance. Yeah, in the animal that received it. Okay. Yeah, so just to be clear, if, if we took what they did in this study, just to reflect why or the different depots of fat are harmful. And so the, the human body has two distinct fat depots, and you and I described them. Subcutaneous, which is the fat beneath the skin, or visceral, which is the fat tucked within the organs of the abdominal space. And if you move subcutaneous fat 
which Look, is like the belly fat. The belly fat, and, and from one animal to another, you couldn't do this in humans. If you move belly fat, if you will, or subcutaneous fat from one animal to the other, the animal's very healthy. It's no problem. Subcutaneous fat is inert. It really is just sort of hanging out there and minding its own business. But in that same study, if you move the visceral adipose over, now all of a sudden that animal that got that extra dose of visceral fat is going to become sicker. It's going to become more insulin resistant and diabetic because you've increased its visceral fat, the amount of fat that it has in that space. The body wants to limit the amount of fat that it has there because if the fat, again, if the fat grows too much, you can physically start compressing and squishing organs that you need to be functioning, like the kidneys and the intestines. Have you seen Brian Johnson? I have. I don't know him personally, but... You've seen the documentaries and stuff made about yeah. him and the, the work that he's doing. What do you make of what he's doing to extend his age? Because, you know, one of the subjects I think is linked to this is the idea of longevity yeah. and aging. And he's become a, a bit of a poster child for the subject of longevity. Right, right. Well, I want to address this because this is a real person. So I want to address it very politely and diplomatically. I think that I want to distinguish the difference between longevity research and science, which is a very real living, breathing field, and I'm proud to know individuals who are longevity scientists, and distinguish them from um, longevity, you said poster child, so the, the gurus of longevity, and that's not the same thing. So what I say, I don't mean to it to be an indictment of longevity research, but I don't mind if people hear a bit of an indictment in my voice of the modern longevity guru approach. So these individuals, and he is certainly the most um, well-known, they do have the advantage of never really being able to be proven wrong. <laughs> you know, so there's an inherent problem here. But I will say that the, the application of being a longevity um, expert, or not a scientist, but a, a guru, and I don't mean for that to be negative, but it does have a bit of a negative sound to it, is that you have to rely on what I would call weak evidence. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, so all of the approaches to longevity nowadays rely on either correlational studies or basic research or animals and insect studies, and then extrapolating that results or assuming those same results will apply to the human. So let me briefly just mention my concerns with correlational research. So the longevity guru will say, correlational evidence suggests that people who eat meat um, die more. Well, a correlational study is, by my estimation, some of the weakest evidence that you can ever generate. A, a correlational study would just have someone come to your home and say, Stephen, can you please answer this survey about what you eat? You answer the survey. You may lie. You may not remember. You may have things that you don't even think about including, like, for example, that you're part of a very um, well put together religious organization. And I actually use that example very deliberately because people who are known to be part of good tight social circles like a formal religious group always live longer than people who don't. Maybe you're really lonely. Loneliness is a greater contributor to death than cigarette smoking, and it's not even close. So there could be things on that survey that you just cannot capture, and yet we end up making a conclusion. And so all of that correlational evidence is deeply flawed research, and yet that becomes the basis for the longevity guru to determine diet. So yep. if I'm trying to extend my longevity, yeah. trying to live longer, then exactly what sh should I be thinking yeah. about? Yeah, so my view on longevity is a metabolic view. No surprise, I'm a metabolic scientist, and I don't mind someone sort of smirking at me declaring that or admitting it, but I'm somewhat justified. Just by way of setting the stage, the earliest, the birth of the modern longevity research, uh, it, if it didn't start, it was heavily influenced by the work of a woman named Cynthia, Cynthia Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N. Cynthia Kenyon was one of the kind of, she really did, in my mind, kind of give, give birth to the modern longevity focus. What her lab found using an insect model and this is, again, a problem with the longevity gurus is that they rely on insect data, um, for example. But it was compelling what she found. I think it was worms she found in worms that if they restricted the glucose that the worms were eating, they would live 50% longer or some, some fantastic increase in the, how long the animals lived. That kind of gave birth to the idea of fasting being beneficial. But it also allowed her lab to start playing around with some of the genes 
of these little insects. And when they started knocking down or underexpressing some of the genes involved in insulin, they didn't have to restrict the food. The animals just lived longer. And so that touches on this metabolic aspect. And everyone nowadays is really interested in autophagy. Autophagy is a term for a cell essentially cleaning itself out. Which is typically associated with long fasting. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. In fact, yes. So that is partly why fasting has been so embraced within the fa uh, longevity community. It's because if you can promote longevity, or autophagy rather, if you can promote autophagy, the cell keeping itself cleaned out, that is thought to be a key contributor to longevity. So autophagy equating to longevity. I don't disagree with that. I think that probably is a very valid view. Then the question comes, well, how can I control autophagy? Well, there is a humble hormone that comes from the pancreas that has a very powerful effect on autophagy called insulin. So as much as people are fasting, what's the value of fasting and reducing autophagy? It's because insulin comes down. Now, what becomes interesting is what happens if you were to put someone, allow them to eat calories, but the calories are such that their insulin is staying low and they're making ketones, in other words, a ketogenic diet. You also enable autophagy. There was a very well done animal study finding that they didn't have to restrict calories and fast the animals. They could let the animals eat as much as they wanted, but it was a ketogenic diet. They lived significantly longer than their other litter mates that were eating the normal high carb chow, similar to what humans eat nowadays. And so autophagy probably does matter for longevity. All the more reason to keep your insulin in check because insulin is a powerful inhibitor of autophagy. So as much as we have longevity gurus who are taking thousands of dollars worth of supplements, I can't help but look at that and think, just control your insulin, that within every cell there's this battle, there's a yin-yang of growth and death, or building and breaking, to say it a little more politely. In fact, that is metabolism. The very word metabolism encompasses anabolism, which is anabolic or building up, and catabolism or catabolic, which is breaking down. The key to a healthy, growing, living cell is this nice ongoing balance of build and break, build and break. You have to build something up and then modestly break it down. And then you build some things up again. And autophagy is a very important part of that breaking cycle within the cell that, hey, it's time to get rid of some old parts and now we'll rebuild some of that again. Now we're gonna break down these parts and rebuild it. Insulin is the key to that process. If insulin stays high for too long, you never allow the catabolic or the breakdown. This is one reason why insulin is so facilitative to cancer. Insulin wants things to grow. Cancer is a disease of growth. We don't ever let the cancer start to break down. Insulin won't let it in part. You've um, repeatedly talked about ket ketosis. I have. Ketones. We'll yeah. eventually get there. We're kind of teasing the audience a little bit. But yeah, we are. Know. Yeah, so But rightly so. I mean, ketones are a very vilified, misunderstood part of the body. And, and to my great delight, um, it's getting it's getting a sort of new appreciation. Well, I'm currently on the keto diet as well. So I am incredibly interested to understand, A, like what's going on in my body, but B, I, I'm quite compelled by both the pros and cons of doing it. And I mm -hmm. want to talk about the cons and the pros mm -hmm. um, because they both exist. One thing you say in your book, Why We Get Sick, is that the longest living humans are also the most insulin sensitive. Yeah. So you're telling me that the longest living humans are the ones that are able to stave off that insulin resistance. Yes, yes, so there keep, are. Keep their insulin levels lower. That's right, yeah. In fact, most of the longevity research, a sort of a final point on this, um, is that when you look at these studies that look back in time and say, okay, what is it about these people? What variables tend to go along with the longest lived humans? One of them is that they're insulin sensitive and their blood glucose levels are, in fact, a very well done study just last year out of Sweden. I think it was just one year ago. They looked at all, and Sweden is meticulous in its, in its record keeping, which is an advantage. And in a fairly homogenous society, so it kind of eliminates some confounding variables. But they attempted to document what, are the, what were the variables that were just the most consistent theme of people who lived very long. One of them was good glucose control. And this next one is very controversial because they found that they also, the longest lived people had high cholesterol levels. 
and isn't that funny? It is one of the most consistent themes of longevity research that the longest lived people have higher cholesterol. And yet we live in a world that hates cholesterol. And the moment cholesterol goes up, we put them on a cholesterol lowering medication. We could be doing the perfectly wrong thing to help these people live longer. So that was, and, and then low uric acid, and there's a handful of other little variables that fit into this. Sorry, the, they found that some of the longest living humans had high cl yeah. cholesterol levels. Yeah, that's right. That's what the Sweden study found, for example. The paper just published a year or so ago, what were some of the most consistent themes? They had good glucose control and high cholesterol. I'm a great defender of, of cholesterol. It is a molecule of life. And it's so many, so much depends on it. Mitochondria, for example, mitochondria have to have a cholesterol